Hello everyone, in this video we'll be going over the basics of modular arithmetic. I'll give you some definitions, go over some examples, provide a list of additional topics and resources. I will also list those in the description. Let's get started. So modular arithmetic is a system of arithmetic for integers where numbers wrap around a certain value which is called the modulus. So you can also define it as clock arithmetic if you think about the 12 hour or the 24 hour clock we have, uh, you know, numbers that are wrapped around and then when you go to higher numbers, they're always going to repeat. So basically, we can kind of de use these numbers only and they're known as the residues modulo n. Okay, now let's look at another definition and this is kind of like a more formal definition of modular arithmetic or a, a congruent statement. So A is congruent to B mod n if and only if n divides a minus b. And in this case, a, b, and n are integers and n needs to be greater than one. Okay, so let's kind of look at some examples. For example, I can say something like five is congruent to two mod three because three divides five minus two because five minus two is equal to three and it's divisible by three. You can also say the statement n divides a minus b, a, a minus b as a minus b is a multiple of n. Okay, so you can write it like a minus b is n times k, where k is an integer. Okay, so that's basically what it is. Or we can write another statement, which will be true as well. For example, how about something like 4 is congruent to negative 1 mod 5, and we're going to be using negative numbers as well. This is also true because if you think about it, 5 divides 4 minus negative 1. Here we have to be careful we're subtracting a negative number. Okay, now let's take a look at this example here. This is one of the first examples that I actually uh, go over when I teach modular arithmetic. Find all possible values of n if 11 is congruent to, so that's how we read it, congruent to 5 mod n. So in this case we don't know the modulus, we're trying to find it, and we do know that 11 is always congruent to 5. So we can use our formal definition, basically what it means is if a is congruent to b mod n, then n divides a minus b. So we can safely say that n divides 11 minus 5, which means n divides 6. And of course n needs to be greater than 1 and it's going to be an integer. So what integers divide 6? We have 1, 2, 3, and 6. Since we're not going to count 1, we have 2, 3, and 6. These are going to be the possible values of n. Okay, great. Now, modular arithmetic. Well, why do we use modular arithmetic? It deals with remainders. So if you take a positive integer a and divide it by n, another positive integer, and let the quotient be q and the remainder r, then from division algorithm, we can basically write the following, which implies a is congruent to r mod n. Let me go ahead and explain this with an example. So suppose you're tra dividing 13 by 5, right? But of course, when you divide it by 5, the quotient is going to be 2, and the remainder is going to be 3, right? Okay, so what is that supposed to mean? It means that in, in this mod, which is mod 5, we're talking about mod 5 here, because we're dividing by 5. Remember, when you divide by n, you're talking about mod n. Okay, so when we divide 13 by 5, we're getting a remainder of 3, mod 5. That's what how you can basically write it. Here, the quotient doesn't really matter. What matters is the remainder. Okay? So, we're not necessarily saying that, you know, a is congruent to r mod n implies that the remainder is r, but it's actually the other way around. Okay, we're going to be looking at more examples, so let me just go ahead and move forward so we don't spend too much time on this topic. The definition of congruence also applies to negative values, like we talked about before. 2 is congruent to negative 3 mod 5, negative 8 is congruent to 7, and negative 3 is congruent to negative 8. All these statements are true, and you can always check by looking at, for example, the first one is going to be 5 divides 2 minus negative 3, which is true. 5 divides negative 8 minus 7, which is again true, and 5 divides negative 3 minus negative 8. All right, all of these are true statements. So that's how you can basically use negative values. And they're very helpful sometimes. I'll show you a couple examples where they are extremely helpful. For example, this one. We can use addition. Okay, so one of the things that you can do, it, since it's a system of arithmetic, but you're doing it with a finite number of integers, which is kind of cool, 
you're allowed to do pretty much the same thing that you do normally. So you can add the same number, you can subtract the same number, you can multiply by the same number, but division is kind of problematic. We're gonna, we're gonna look at division in the next example. So let's solve this equation, for example. Since I can subtract three from both sides, this gives me x squared is congruent to negative three mod seven. Now, obviously negative three as a perfect square doesn't make sense. And we're not gonna go into the I business here, you know, we're gonna keep it real, for reals, okay? So x squared is congruent to negative three mod seven. How can I handle this? Well, I can add seven to both sides because one of the things that we should always keep in mind is seven is congruent to zero mod seven. Why? Because the difference between seven and zero is divisible by seven. So this is always true. So we can safely say that n is congruent to zero mod n all the time, which is really good to know. And we can generalize this even more like n k, if you have a multiple of n, it's always gonna be zero mod n as well. So this is good to know. Now I can just go ahead and add seven to both sides, but remember that seven is congruent to zero. So instead of adding seven here, I can just add zero on the left hand side. So this gives me x squared is congruent to four mod seven. Now this is nice because four is a perfect square. And from here, I can kind of branch off and say, x is either two, I mean congruent to, of course, or negative two mod seven. But remember, we're allowed to add seven or multiples of seven. So negative two is congruent to five mod seven. So in mod seven, this equation has two solutions, two and five. And when you when I say mod seven, you should always think about this finite set, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six, because these are the all possible remainders upon division by seven. That's pretty much what we're dealing with. Now, if you look at the second example here on this page, we said that division is problematic. Let, let's illustrate why, why that's the case. If you divide, for example, well, is this true? First of all, let's go ahead and check that. Is 10 congruent to four mod six? Yes, because 10 minus four is six. You see, there's a quick way to check that. You don't even have to go to the remainder business here. But anyways, so let's go ahead and divide both sides by two because two is a common factor. So is it true that five is congruent to two mod six? Well, obviously that's not true because if you think about five mod six, it can be congruent to five mod six itself, or you can add five and write it as 11, or subtract six and write it as negative one. So we're gonna, we're not gonna have two being congruent to five. And you can also obviously check that five minus two is equal to three, and six obviously does not divide three. Or I should probably write it more clearly as five minus two. So it makes more sense, right? Okay, so division is problematic, and there is a way to overcome that sometimes, because we have a common divisor, if you divide both sides, including the mod by two, then you'll be good to go. Okay, let's take a look at this example. This is kind of interesting and this kind of puts us in a position where one of our additional topics talks about quadratic uh, residues and stuff like that. So this is a really fun topic, but we'll talk about that later. Anyways, what number in mod four uh, squared is gonna be congruent to two, two? When you think about this, you might be thinking, okay, I'm gonna add four to both sides. You can make the six, you can make uh, like 10, so on and so forth, but you'll never get a perfect square. Well, let's see what happens. When I say mod four, you should understand this list, right? Zero, one, two, three. So these are possible remainders. These are possible numbers in mod four. So let's go ahead and square each one of them. For example, zero squared is zero mod four. One squared is one mod four. 2 squared is 4 mod 4, but let's go ahead and write it as 0. And 3 squared is 9, but if you divide it by 4 and look at the remainder, you're going to get 1 mod 4. So all these numbers, so this is the set of x's and this is the set of x squares, right? What do you notice? Well, if you square a number and you look at it mod 4, it's never going to equal or it's never going to be congruent to 2 mod 4. So this equation has no solution because a perfect square can never be two mod four. And you can easily verify this. Think about, well, this basically means that X is even. And if you square even numbers, you're gonna notice that they're never gonna leave a remainder of two mod four, okay? Cool. So this equation has no solution. What about negative exponents? Well, we're talking about negative exponents, but there are no negative exponents. Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go with, first of all, let me tell you, division is not like a standard procedure. So we don't really write like one third. One third, like a fraction is not defined in mod five or in any mod. So what we're gonna do instead is multiply both sides by the inverse of three. So let's go ahead and multiply both sides by three inverse 
And let's see what happens. Of course, I'm multiplying from the left to be kind of like exact. That's what we're going to get. So this gives you now, when you multiply a number by its inverse, obviously, that's going to give you the identity element, which when multiplied by x gives you x. So this is basically going to be like a 1 in multiplication. So we're going to be getting x from here. And when you multiply by 1, of course, it's going to be the same. So in other words, the number we're looking for is the inverse of 3 mod 5. But how do you find the inverse of a number or any number to the negative exponent? Well, let's go ahead and think about this. Mod 5, I'm allowed to add 5 or multiples of 5. So let's go ahead and add 5 to 1 to make it 6. And this equation is definitely solvable. You can divide both sides by 3 because 3, 6, and 5 do not have a common factor. So we can go ahead and divide, and that's going to give us x is congruent to 2 mod 5. And that's basically going to be the solution. So the inverse of 3 is 2 mod 5, which means the inverse of 2 is also 3. So 2 and 3 are inverses uh, mod 5. In any mod, can we find inverses? That's not always the case because you can't always get a 1. All right, that's another interesting topic, which I'm going to leave open-ended for now. Now let's take a look at this example. This is an example from a 3rd century AD Chinese book. You've probably seen similar problems. These are fairly common. We have a number of things, but we do not know how many. We count them by threes. We get, we have two left over. If you count by fives, three left over and sevens, we have two left over. So we can actually write this as a system of congruences. How? Well, the number we're looking for, let's call that X. X is going to be two mod five. I mean, two mod three. X is congruent to three mod five. And X is congruent to 2 mod 7. Obviously, this is a system of congruences, and this system has a solution. And that solution in this case would be 23. For example, if you think about the number 23, you're basically talking about something when you divide by 3, you're going to get a remainder of 2. When you divide by 5, it's going to be 3. And when you divide by 7, you're going to get 2. So X equal X is congruent to 23. So 23 satisfies the system. But to be able to find this and solve this, of course, with higher mods, it's much harder. We have something called Chinese remainder theorem, which I also included in additional topics. OK, so that's a very interesting topic, uh, something that we're probably going to talk about later. So modular arithmetic deals with remainders, we said. And of course, it also deals with um, problems like this. For example, we can use modular arithmetic to find the ones digit of this number. Obviously, this is a very large number, right? You would probably agree. Like, just to give you an idea about the magnitude, just an approximation, like 2 to the 10th power is pretty close to, you know, uh, 1,000, which is 10 to the 3rd power. So if you raise 2 to the 10th power, so I can probably safely say that something like 2 to the 10th is close to 10 to the 3rd. And then if I raise this to the power 200, that's going to be close to, well, kind of. 10 to the power 3 to the power 200, which is like 10 to the power 600. So you're basically talking about something, uh, one followed by, or at least something that has 600 something digits, right? That's a really large number. Obviously, we're not going to calculate that, and we're not even going to look at the ones digit of this number. Obviously, there's an easier way to do it. When they say ones digit, you would always think about it. If I divide a number by 10, the remainder is going to be the ones digit, right? So if you have 584. The remainder is 4, obviously. Or if you have 100, the remainder will be 0. So what we need to do then is work in mod 10. How do you work in mod 10? We're going to be evaluating this number. So let me go ahead and do the following. 2 is 2 mod 10. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to raise 2 to higher power. So this is 2 to the first power. What about 2 to the second power? It's 4. Again, mod 10, I'm not going to repeat it, but you know it's mod 10. 2 to the third is 8. And then 2 to the fourth is 16, but I can write it as 6 because uh, 6 and 16 are congruent mod 10. So if you continue this pattern, you're going to notice that 2 to the fifth is 32, or just multiply the 6 by 2, you'll get 12, which is 2 mod 10. Now notice that this pattern is going to start repeating, right? So it repeat, we have a cycle of 4. Therefore, we just have to figure out where 2021 falls. And if you look at 1, 2, 3, 4, these are kind of like mod 4 numbers, right? So 2021 is going to leave us a remainder of 1 when divided by 4. So in other words, I can safely say that 2021 is 1 mod 4. So it's going to be congruent to 1, which means that the 1's digit is going to be 2. Okay? 
Let's continue with more examples. What is the remainder when this number, the sum, infinite sum, is divided by 9? So we have all these factorials, and we're trying to divide by 9. Now, what do you know about factorials? Well, 5 factorial is 120, 6 factorial is 720, and this, it's divisible by 720, right? I mean, 9 divide 720, in other words. Okay, so starting with 6 factorial, so it's, here's what's going on. Let me go ahead and write more terms here to show you what's going on. Obviously, anything higher than 6 factorial contains 6 factorial. Therefore, all of these terms are divisible by 9. Therefore, they leave a remainder of 0. So the only thing that I need to look at is the first 5. And it's kind of like 1 plus 2 plus 6 plus 24 plus 120. Obviously, this ends in 0. Let's see what happens. This is going to give me a 30, 150, and that's going to be 153. Now, how do you find the remainder when this number is divided by 9? Uh, well, you're just going to add up the digits, and that's going to give you the answer, right? Okay, and that is 9. Therefore, this number is going to be divisible by 9, which means it's going to leave the remainder of 0. Okay, cool. Let's take a look at another problem. What's the remainder when 2 to the nth plus 6 times 9 to the nth is divided by 7? Now, here's one thing that you might be thinking. You might just plug in some values for n and see what's going on, right? I mean, that's probably going to work because if you have a fixed remainder, it, it should work with n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, whatever. Well, in this case, uh, I guess we are defining n to be a positive integer. So let's say n is an element of positive integers so that we don't have to deal with stuff like 0. Okay, now how does this work? Here's what, what I can do. 9 to the nth, since 9 is congruent to 2 mod 7, right? This is mod 7. 9 to the nth is going to be congruent to 2 to the nth. Because one of the things that I guess forgot I forgot to say is you can raise both sides to a power. You can add, multiply, subtract, and raise both sides to a power. But division is a little tricky. Now, so what I can do is I can basically replace this 9 to the nth with 2 to the nth, since they're congruent. And this gives me 1 times 2 to the nth plus 6 times 2 to the nth, which is 7 times 2 to the nth. And as you know, any multiple of 7 is congruent to 0 mod 7. Therefore, the remainder is, again, 0 when this number is divided by 7. And you can, again, test it, test it with certain values. All right? Cool. Now, this brings us to the end of this video. But let me briefly talk about some additional topics here. Well, we have Chinese remainder theorem, which I briefly mentioned to solve systems of congruences. Fermat's little theorem is very interesting, again, for solving congruences. Euler's theorem is obviously huge. And then there's a couple other topics. There was one video that I made that could use Hansel's lemma. Remember, uh, there was a mod 49, I think, problem where you have the prime power modulus. And those are very interesting topics. And of, co of course, quadratic recipes are... <laughs> Okay, it's hard to say. Quadratic reciprocity is super duper interesting. And these are some of the resources that I used. I'm going to include these in the description as well. And one more time, this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Tomorrow, I'll see you with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.